Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, my name is Richard Burson. I direct the Center for 21st Century Studies. And we're really happy, really delighted to uh, host uh, Fatima Regis and Daniel Marquez here at the Center. One of the things that we've tried to do over the last years at the Center is make space available for visiting scholars both within the U.S. and uh, really uh, more interestingly and excitedly outside of the U.S. And for the kind of accidental reasons that I think happen in life, um, I've spent quite a bit of time in Brazil this decade. I think I first went in 2012 for a conference. Maybe that's where I first met the, the first Secret Life of Objects, where I first met Fatima, and um, have been back probably about a half dozen times since then. And we've also been fortunate to host uh, Brazilian scholars. So we hosted today our first Fulbright uh, doctoral student uh, several years ago, um, Jose Messias, who is a, actually a student of Fatima. So we have kind of genealogy. Um, a couple of years ago, we uh, hosted uh, Gabriel Manavi, who is a professor uh, in just north of Rio. And um, this year, in addition to Fatima Reggi, we're uh, hosting Daniel Marquez, and Daniel's uh, mentor, PhD advisor, uh, Andre Lemos, is somebody who I also have been fortunate to meet uh, in Salvador. So we have kind of genealogical connections here. Uh, so if you, any faculty have, if you know people who are visiting and need a home, we are happy to host people. We don't have funds to invite international guests, but uh, Brazil, at least before the current administration, has been a pretty generous uh, nation, it seems to me, in providing funding to uh, support <coughs> academics for international studies. So, um, so I'm not going to give a formal, uh, more formal introduction. The website contains information about who they are, the announcements, and uh, you can read that there. I will just say before turning it over to Fatima that. Uh, Afterward, at 5 o'clock, you're invited, when, when we finish, should be around 5, invited to join us on the ninth floor of Curtin Hall, where we have some recept refreshments for reception and also maybe the best view on campus. So um, if you haven't been up there, just come up for the view, if not. So with that, uh, agents for the scholarship. Uh, well, I think it's a research I've been doing for almost two decades, so I think it's important uh, to tell you that people, of course, uh, the process that brought this research to, to this point. Uh, well, in a broader sense, uh, 
my research is in the intersection of media studies, technologies, and subjectives. For a long ago, at the beginning of the internet, cybercultural scholars used to say that transformations in media systems uh, stimulate the development of cognitive skills, of intelligence, of competence in their users. And at uh, that time, I was intrigued about what exactly were uh, these competence and skills. So, uh, formulated a question uh, just like this. Which competence and skills adolescents are developing in their everyday life connections with digital media? We were working around this time for, long, for some decades. Wow. Uh, for over uh, a little more than 10 years, in our lab in Latin Brazil, we undertook some theoretical and empirical research, and we found uh, a lot of competence that they are listed here. Uh, and we separated in these two blocks, not because they are really separated, because uh, as a fact they are interwined, but uh, just to, to what the same development. So we can see that there were reading, writing, text interpretation, logic, accused attentions that are competence that, relate, that are related to a more print and book-based learning. And there are also other competences, like teamwork, do-it-yourself creativity, multiple languages like the, the use of photos, texts, videos, and so on, social and affective skills, speed attention, and uh, that some scholars like James Paul G, Kurt Squire, uh, are calling these competences as game-based learning. And uh, as you can see, th there's no much disagreement on, this, disagreement on this. There are certain consensus. And here are some references that are a lot of others. They're not here. Um, the first conclusion, of course, is that in a media study, studies point of view, it's clear that these competences <coughs> aren't restricted to the print and book-based learnings, uh, but also they, they <coughs> encompasses uh, competences related to other media, televisual, uh, games, internet, and a lot of others. Uh, we organize, we organize these competences in five categories sociality, utility, and so on. And uh, of course, what I what's interesting here, uh, what stands out most to us, is that these competences are not just print and book based competences. So the thing is, uh, how are, are those sensor, uh, sensory, tactile, social skills, cognitive to? Uh, that's uh, a question. Uh, what explains this for us is the cognitive scientists. That is also our, one of our basic conceptual frameworks. Uh, cognitive science are very interesting because they are hybrid science since the beginning. Uh, they, be they began comprising human, social, technological, biomedical, uh, uh, scholars, expertise, and science. And there are a lot of approaches in cognitive sciences. Uh, the approach I draw on, the, the approach I like best, is situated cognition, also known as a body of cognition, connectionism, which appear uh, some authors, and the an action, or invented the cognition by Francisco Varela, principally. Uh, Varela is very interesting because he can, connect, uh, being a neurologist, he connects to the the body with the, our brain, and, uh, and he thinks mind uh, connected with the world. And so we connected our, our mind, our cognition with the environment, and with our history culture also. It's really very interesting person. Well, uh, there are three key points I'd like to sing out about the cognitive science.
The first is that mind is embodied. Yeah, it, uh, that means that mind is not a, a, an abstract thing that computes signs, or symbols, or representations. Mind is embodied, and when they said embodied, it's not just embedded in the brain, it's embedded in the top body, and mind also enfolds the context, enfolds the environment. Uh, the second one, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask you, so sorry. Uh, so the first is mind is mind, the second is cognition is situated. That means that cognitions, the cognitive process, depends on context and experience. And that means that things like meaning, discourse, representation, are not enough to explain the way we learn, the way we, we communication, the, uh, and the way the literacy is, of course. And the third one is that cognitive sciences also this the construction, the idea of a human as a subject, rational, conscious, and owner of his own free will. Uh, and this, as a consequence, uh, signifies that they deconstruct also some dichotomies like subject versus object, individual versus environment, human versus animal, reason versus effect. Uh, this third point uh, is really very interesting because uh, this has consequences for a lot of other concepts that we work with every day, like the communication, mediation, like what is mind, uh, like who thinks, um, and so on, and like what's human to it. Um, so, uh, how our actual uh, research is about literacy. One thing important is that literacy is not just about writing and reading, of course, yeah, in this kind of way. Literacy is a social and concrete process, and for a media point of view, literacy, of course, involves and encompasses other media, other processes, for the communication process. Um, this kind of, of process of a conceptual framework aligns uh, our, uh, my, my research, my theories I draw on, aligns with it something that Richard Bruce called the non-human term. And here are some theories and some authors that uh, is aligned with this kind of, of research, of thinking, of questions. And so I think that's the, the principle, the main, the main uh, interlink between my research and the C21 and Richard research. There is a quote that quotes on the shirt. And, um, And so, uh, of course, I work in a, in a very interdisciplinary approach. Uh, Varela would say a trans transdisciplinary approach. Uh, well. well, in short, what we see is that uh, uh, the conceptuals, this, this conceptual framework, the conceptuals of situated cognition argue against the idea of cognition and intelligence based on representations, abstract ideas, interpretation, and logic, just. Uh, which, of course, is basically topics of literary culture, of print and book based literacies and learning. So, what we see is that, of course, it's not new, but that's a kind of school lab, because, uh, it's, of course, it's not separated in this way, it's just uh, there are interlinks between these two columns, but basically, the school are uh, teaching things like this, printing book-based learning, 
they are based on, on a transmissionist pedagogy. They work with extra types of knowledge, storage that, that is memorizing formulas, signs, symbols, and so they are connected very connected with the classical literacy, what we call the classical literacy. And this is what our kids, our students got in school, and that is what they needed to, to experience the world, to act in the real world some characteristics of the digital culture. Uh, I repeat, it's not, of course, part this way. And so, uh, so as I told you, I've been working with this for a, a long time, and I've been thinking, what can we do? Now, of course, it's not, it's beyond my power, beyond the, my the, the communication field, even, uh, to transform all of this. But, Certainly, there are some things that we could do. So we engage it in two complementary actions, two complementary strategies. The first one is that we are creating an interdisciplinary research network uh, to deep on new media literacy. New media literacy is, is another complex concept. But we could say game-based learning, or multiple literacies, and uh, we are trying to do an um, interdisciplinary enterprise, and we are uh, getting in touch. These already are our partners in Brazil in these areas: computer engineering, arts and design, and uh, this is Jose Messias <laughs> Buffman. He's now is a professor here. And uh, these are our, our partners in Brazil. And of course, we like to expand this, this network, and that's why I'm here. We like to, uh, to deepen the, the dialogue that we already have with you. And the other strategy is to do something with the schools. Because uh, the teachers in Brazil are fundamental middle, high schools, are keen to, to use the games, to use the other forms of literacy, but they don't know how. And of course, it's a, it's, Brazil is a great country. It's very big. We have a lot of problems, different problems. It's not easy, but we are trying to do something small, and then maybe we can grow a little. So what we are doing is trying to create some active methodologies that can address to new media literacy learning. So how we are doing this? We get in touch, of course, with the Brazilian middle schools. There are schools to sixth to ninth grade. And uh, we are carrying out workshops, uh, putting together teachers and students. What I'm trying to do is, uh, well, <laughs> What we're trying to do is to create some form of adapt, some form of tra transcript this kind of learning to that kind of learning. Um, so what we do, we encourage students and teachers to adapt to the curricular content. We cannot escape from the curriculum because there are uh, official curricula, they are based on representations, <coughs> on the, the, the old school mode. We can, we can fight against this. But we can try to, we can, uh, try to create some uh, different activities, resources that make this a little more smooth, a little more playful for the kids. And so what we do is to pick uh, a discipline, a subject that can be met Portuguese, English, history, art, science, whatever, and uh, to work on the, the content of the discipline, because you cannot escape from this, but try to transcribe it to another media product. The, the students choose what media they want to work. That can be a game, that can be a comic, a, a board game, a video, whatever they can. And, uh, and I, besides this, we try to promote a learning 
that also stimulate them to develop of artistic, social, psychological, and other skills. And what's next? Uh, our methodology is called the intervention research. It comes from action research, then there were institutional research, and now intervention research. We also work with some ethnography. And what we're trying to do, as I told you, is something that creates a methodology that is participatory, playful, and using multimodal communication. So, okay. So, uh, what I try uh, to, uh, what we're trying to do is to work with the schools that are closer to our home university, WED, that is very near to Maracanã the stadium, the soft soccer stadium, and this is one of these schools. Uh, named the uh, Scholar Municipal Madrid. And uh, these workshops were held in 2016. Uh, 2016 was the year that Rio de Janeiro held the Olympic Games. So it was a very interesting context to work with each other. And uh, uh, in the beginning, we were supposed to work with the teaching, the disciplines, of history and sciences, but the, the time of the bureaucracy and papers took so long that the history teacher uh, retired. So <laughs> we worked just with the science teacher. And, uh, and the it was a class with 44 students. And uh, here is the details. The discipline was sciences and uh, Eighth grade for four students. The science contents, the syllabus, uh, we work for them for two months. So uh, these were the, the, the silos uh, food, digestive system, circulation system. And they, they choose it to do a um, um, role playing game. So, of course, people, people of the game, uh, it's not a, it was not a sophisticated game. It's a, Simple one, and uh, the game mission was uh, we we made groups with students, eight groups, and each each group was a team, and they were like coaches to the athletes, uh, and the the objective of them were were to prepare athletes to achieve the best performance in the in the Olympic game. So uh, the first uh, the first step was to create the avatar, the character. So uh, we, uh, we 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 did ten encounters during these two months with the, the students and the teachers, and of course everyone working together, and based on the the syllabus. So uh, this is the, the athlete sheets. They have to create a, a, a character. Uh, that is the instructions to them for the game. Here are them creating the, the avatars, drawing their, their athletes. Uh, here is the, the sheets they done. And what we try to do was to pick the class content like food digestion process and to adapt to transcript from the book based to something else. To gain it based on something else. This is the textbook of science. This is the diagram of food digestion process and this is supposed uh, the, the way they supposed to learn. And, uh, very print and book based learning way. And what we did, uh, well, there are a lot of motives for this, 
where we need to put the children in the sports court to do the activities. And this one, what, is, what we're looking at is, is the, the is it. Uh, these are, we make uh, spots. At, uh, uh, each spot you're seeing here represents one part of the digest system. So one spot was the mouth, the other was the esophagus, the other was the stomach, and the skin, and so on. And we also take to this, to this workshop um, a market of food. We, we take uh, trash food, we take uh, healthy food, and the, the students who are supposed to pick a food and to pass through it through each of one of these uh, spots in the circle. And they have to say what, uh, the, what the mouth do with the food, what happens to the food in the stomach, and so on. So we think we, we kind of, of did an immersive simulation of the digest system. So it's, of course, it's a more playful activity with body expression and things like this. And we, we also try, and that this is just one encounter. We also have a lot of other encounters, and uh, we, we try to, to help them to do research in textbooks. Of course, we don't have a lot of textbooks. Uh, cell phones and so on, sometimes we use it, our computers because they don't have two good computers. There are activities like meter training when they are encouraged to elaborate question and answers for interviews. One, one team interview the other team, the other half-life, things like this. And there are other uh, activities. Solve problems together, it's another kind of, of questions. Like games, there are rules, there are deadlines for them to, to accomplish it solving problems, and the main outcomes is uh, we had a lot of problems, though. don't think it was easy, we have all, all kind of problems. Uh, but of course, the, the, we can say the workshops simulated the kind of skills, uh, aroused the, the, students, uh, the students' interest. It is very interesting because uh, exactly the, the worst students or the more engaged in these activities. It's really interesting. Th that's, uh, of course, I'm not an educator, but of course there are different forms that you can teach something and look to other forms and so on. And, uh, and uh, the, in, the, in the time of evaluation, the science teacher, that's uh, Professor Lindsay, told us they got very uh, bad grades uh, in the school test. It's interesting because, of course, the exams are classical exams, but the different way of teaching uh, helps in this too. So it's, uh, we are in the very beginning of this. This is our team at the university. There are uh, the professors, PGs, master candidates, undergraduates, and more works. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank 
UWAM and C21 for hosting me this year. It has been an incredible experience so far. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Brazilian Fulbright Commission and my advisor in Brazil, Professor Andrea Lemos, uh, for their full support. And last but not least, my home university, uh, Federal University of Reconcavo da Bahia, for granting me this sabbatical, even under continuous pressure from Bolsonaro's ultra-conservative authoritarian regime. <laughs> Important. Uh, as a non-native non English speaker, uh, I ask you to bear with me during this talk. There is a PDF version available at this QR code here uh, for the sake of accessibility, uh, if that's helpful in any way. Uh, okay, so that means that being said, let's uh, get started. Um, as someone who had never reflected on privacy before, I was struck with curiosity when I first came across the idea of privacy by design. Even though I'm not a law scholar, most privacy scholars are law scholars. Uh, I'm a designer myself, and therefore the idea of thinking about privacy and design together intrigued me. To put it shortly, Privacy by Design stands for a framework aimed at, de aimed at developers, designers, and project managers who seek to engineer privacy in the early stages of product, product development, uh, mainly focused on digital artifacts. Initially proposed by Anne Kavukian, former Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, Canada, this framework has been widely discussed by scholars from different fields such as information security, user interface design, computer science, computer engineering, project manager, management, and so forth. Even though the idea seems interesting, especially since privacy has become such a hot topic of discussion in the 21st century, my initial wonder rapidly turned into a skepticism. How privacy by design can be widely adopted when most tech companies rely on personal data collection and processing for, the, for their business models. <laughs> and I love this picture so much. <laughs> because on, the, on, on one side you have like Zuckerberg on one of the Senate hearings. It's not like the one that happened yesterday, but it's the one that happened like a few months ago after the Cambridge Analytica thing. And the other one is at the conf Facebook conference, the most recent one. Uh, the future is private, yeah. Uh, so let's take a few steps back. Even though privacy is considered a fu uh, funda fundamental human right in, a different, in different constitutions around the globe, is, it is essential to note that the human subject cannot be taken as the unit of analysis here. Uh, oh, just another example, like how Google in alphab Alphabet's uh, revenue is largely based on uh, advertising that also like translates into da data collection and processing. Okay, um, let me get back. To put it differently, we must account for how the human come to matter in a larger assemblage of other humans, institutions, and non-humans, and so forth. The human, therefore, is never pure. It emerges through a hybrid entanglement uh, to use Barat's uh, terminology, translations to use a Laturian terminology, or radical mediations to use Richard's term. Uh, failing to acknowledge this, uh, that failing to acknowledge that uh, this is the first mistake when it comes to discussions about privacy uh, as an internal and subjective concept. To be able to establish the limits between the public and the private then, we need to account for the agency of those assemblages or networks. We need stuff to be able to, make, to have a private life. Privacy is always materially situated as things help us make sense and co-produce social reality. Antoine Proust, one uh, famous privacy uh, historian, writes that if there is one new idea, writing about 20, uh, 21st century uh, France. If there is one new idea in France, it must be that individuals have the right to, to lead their private lives as they see fit. For the first half of the 20th century, private life was, in most respects, subject to communal controls. 
The wall that was supposed to protect individual privacy was a privilege of the bourgeoisie. Even though we could make a broader argument about privacy and material culture, I am more interested in assemblages involving media and communication technologies. Some scholars trace the emergency of modern privacy to the development of print media and the novel as a narrative format. The right to be let alone, an idea uh, that came to matter in the late 20, uh, 19th century, is heavily influenced by the media landscape of that time. For example, uh, Warren Brandes, in one of the first uh, academic papers about privacy, writes that, Recent inventions in business model methods call attention to the next step which must be taken for the protection of the person and for securing to, in, for securing to the individual what Judge Cooley calls the right to be let alone. Instantaneous photographs and newspapers enterprises have invaded the sacred precincts of private and domestic life and numerous uh, mechanical devices threaten to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. It's not hard to recognize the assemblage here. Different things come to matter to establish the border between private and public spaces. The middle class home, the right of mass media, journalism, photography, gossip magazines, celebrity culture, and so forth. Even though we are talking about a drastically different media landscape that, than that from the rise of print, the relationship between privacy and media technology is somewhat evident. This statement poses with an important question. What kind of media environment we have today and how it impacts our enactment of privacy? What are we talking about when it comes to the contemporary media landscape? Uh, that's a challenging uh, que question to answer. Since the right of rise of mass media, media scholarships teach us that mediatization, uh, using as Yarvard have and Coldery uh, terms it, has progressed further and further. We have today a much more intricate and, complete and complicated relationship between media and other social institutions. Mediatization as a theory helps us understand how, so, how the social comes to matter infused by media logic. Media then is to be understood not as a mere ad instrument for communication, medium, but also as a powerful social institution capable of exerting, uh, exerting change in other social institutions as the family, religion, nationality, education, leisure, and social reality itself. Uh, that information, for example, is super interesting. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, a famous a Portuguese football player, now makes more money as a digital influencer on Instagram than as an actual soccer player from <laughs> Juventus. Um, Things get even more complicated when we, and when we account for digital media platforms. Beauty upon, upon Andreas Hepp concept of deep mediatization, it becomes harder and harder to assess what media technologies are, when and where they act to shape social life. Modern mass media became easy to spot. TV, radio, news channels, magazines, advertisements, and movies are undoubtedly media products. But what about uh, relationship apps, wearable devices, Amazon Prime subscriptions, Google Maps? Are those media products as well? Those are critical questions since it, since it directly influences how we make sense of the social as a whole. What we have now, then, is a much more nebulous media landscape, different from the mass media and even from the early days of the internet or the web 2.0, the fast and predatory expansion of digital media conglomerates especially the big five, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, and Microsoft, is fundamentally altering how society functions, understands itself, and the next relations of power. And also the threshold between public and private. Media is not an easy, easily recognizable social institution anymore, commonly associated with particular artifacts. We are, now with, we are now living in a platform society in which digital media become even more embodied less transparent and more pervasive than ever before. A significant portion of our social actions become highly intermediated by digital technologies, even if we are not aware of it. The double logic of remediation is in full speed here. Uh, I would argue that the platformization of society 
uh, and culture is the main characteristic that defines contemporary media environment. Following the lead scholarship on the topic, it is possible to summarize this term, the platform term, in three main points. Uh, the platformization of society itself, the economic and uh, based on the economic and political rise of platforms such as Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Deification, the process <coughs> which social life gets translated into digital data through several different data practices, and the widespread deployment of performative algorithms, computer entities that provide intelligence for digital media. Highly complex social and technical assemblages present, present, uh, present in many different artifacts today. We are calling this in our research group in Brazil the culture of the PD, PDPA, and I'm going to refer by this acronym. Even though uh, some of these processes are redundant with each other, they become representative of 21st century media ecology. It is troublesome to think about how deep the roots of the platform society have grown as a significant part of our daily lives run through highly sophisticated algorithms, data practices, and digital platforms. So what has changed? What are the consequences uh, caused by the platformization of our daily life? The key words here are control, capital, governance, and politics. As we are wit witnessing the rise of the platform society, we also wit witness the rise of platform capitalism, surveillance capitalism, uh, and data capitalism depending on the author. Uh, when data became the new oil, a uh, highly valued uh, commodity, tech companies rapidly adapt in order to extract value from it. Even though I do not have enough time to go into specifics here, data extractivism can be primarily, primarily regarded not only as a new camouflage for capitalism, but also as a new enactment of colonialism and imperialism. This should come as no, as no surprise, since those three are long-time friends. They are mostly interdependent. <laughs> uh, this is a prime example of how the platformization is in full-fledged Tesla, which is mostly a car uh, manufacturer, uh, is also a data company today as well. The platformization of, of everyday life becomes a way to transform citizens into users and consumers. When life comes to matter through digital platforms, we became part of this assemblage. We act through and with those mediators. Their exterior actions help us, helping us perform and act and embody in embody in specific ways. Digital platforms are not just intermediaries in a Latourian sense, but highly skilled mediators. We are continu continually negotiating with them to control or at least try to who have access to our private life and when. Uh, the platformization of everyday life makes our enactment of privacy and intimacy to be uh, highly mediated by, by PDPA media artifacts. Our understanding of privacy then becomes prescri prescribed by media companies. Pre becomes prescribed by media companies. Privacy is not over, far from it, but it takes a different shape. If Mark Zuckerberg said that the future is private, it must be, right? <laughs> Data <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> Data capitalism uh, carefully designs our potential control over personal data. Control, modulation, and governance are not to be understood as abstract or immaterial. If we have established that privacy is always contingent on, ma on materiality, I'm more than human privacy, if you indulge me, the idea of pre prescribed privacy is also materially situated. Platform society and data capitalism cannot be grasped and therefore disputed if conceived as purely immaterial. They, they can only be experienced through things. They make themselves be visible in privacy policies, code, product design, public speeches, patents, lawsuits, predatory inclusion, hostile, takes hostile takeovers, pricing, conferences, conventions, user interface design. This last one is of particular interest for me. User interfaces becomes, become a, an essential space for critical academic inquiry and also political action. Mm -hmm. Acting as mediators, uh, user interfaces ultimately, ultimately attempt to modulate levels of friction, steering user behavior, steering user behavior. Friction is an important word here. It stands for the discrepancy between the amount of effort versus the resistance of a particular environment when an action is performed. Designers and developers uh, design for a certain level of friction. 
since users' interface are always trying to accomplish something, to produce certain specific effects. Humans, human user and digital interfaces then become, uh, come together as assemblages. Interfaces are not just instruments. They uh, are entangled with human subjects to perform actions. Agency is the hybrid, the assemblage. User interfaces can be regarded as a more evident layer, uh, material layer when it comes to the digital platforms. They occupy a critical position as mediators, uh, acting with the user and the platform to sh shape social life. This is one of that one that is one of the reasons why user interfaces become a relevant site for scholarship and political inquiry. Throughout them, we can perceive breaches and identify controversies, gaining some insight into other material layers as algorithms, privacy policies, monetization practices, uh, and so forth. Uh, that being said, user interfaces become fundamental to address problems concerning pr platform capitalism as well. Uh, expanding the idea that digital platforms can prescribe privacy, we could argue that user interfaces become valuable stakeholders that help this project come to fruition. User interfaces actually negotiated, negotiate with the user for the enactment of a particular idea of private life. As expected, this enactment fulfills not the user interests, but the, that of the platforms. Those are, as we have been framing them, malicious interfaces. Uh, they are composed of interaction strategies uh, designed to reproduce the power asymmetry between user and the platform. Malicious interfaces are usually well designed, well designed, helping users perform, uh, helping users perform different actions. That is part of their scheme. The goal of a malicious, malicious interface is to maximize data production and collection, describing the constant need to produce more and more data. They are performative, since they are, at the same time, a byproduct of platformization and also essential agents in that same processes. Malicious interface, as a theoretical framework, were initially proposed by the name of Dark Patterns by Harry Brignew, Brignew in 2010, quoting him, this is the dark side of design, and since, and since this kind of design patterns do not have a name, I'm, propose, I'm proposing we start calling them dark patterns, unquote. An exciting, branch, an exciting branch of scholarship flourished after this. Different scholars, designers, developers started looking into these dark patterns in order to build a common terminology and taxonomy. Even though Brindle initially developed the concept to address problems in e-commerce, dark patterns became a powerful tool to think about privacy problems and in user, interface, in user interfaces. Uh, Most scholars, though, fail to recognize how dark patterns and user interfaces are entangled with a more extensive network of mediations, in particular, in particular those of the PDPA. Dark patterns do not just direct the user into random errors. They seek modulation, control, and governance over the interaction, sometimes in an effective way. It's not just a problem of user literacy either, since some of those interfaces are getting more and more inescapable. Uh, I would ask you, uh, everyone here who has the luxury of not having a Google account or a Facebook account or even to carry a smartphone, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And that's a luxury today. In order to address this, uh, we proposed the term malicious interfaces uh, to expand the idea of the dark pattern. To better understand this problem, our research group in Brazil, uh, Lab 404, developed an empirical analysis of 10 apps current, currently in use in Salvador Bahia, my city. Those apps op offer some public service, ranging from parking to recycling. Some of, the, some of them were designed by public entities and others by private companies. Some fall in the middle. They are related to this state infrastructure but were designed and are being managed by private companies. The myriad of relations in itself is complicated and reveal different problems. With a previously established taxonomy of dark patterns, our task was to look at those apps, their interfaces, and seek for signs of dark patterns. Needless to say, we found dark patterns in all of them. 
Our, result, our results, to summarize, indicated multiple levels of intensity when it comes to subverting user control over personal data. Some of them uh, seem <coughs> seems more aggressive than others. With that knowledge at hand, we were able to outline a gravity scale, structuring three levels of threat. Just a side note, uh, the paper that this, uh, this study resulted in a paper that is coming later this year in English as well, so I'm, I'll be happy to share. Uh, the first level, uh, the, what we're calling light, is composed by dark partners that collect unnecessary data but, have, but that have some relationship with the service provider. Location, for example, location data when, the, when it comes to parking apps, for example. The second level are moderate addresses interfaces that somehow share personal data with third parties. That is, that is a common tactic in data capitalism as apps generally prompt the user to register using Google or Facebook's APIs, for example. The third level, the severe level, is related to those interfaces that collect data unrelated to the app's pri primary function or in a different scenario, when interfaces seek to obfuscate the data practice in some way. Those expose more bluntly the workings of data capitalism and therefore are less common. Uh, these are like, there is a huge taxonomy of data dark patterns. Those are more, the more common ones that we found uh, on the apps. Um, I'm not going to go in that here. This is like the discrepancy between the, the gravity scale. So we found mostly dark patterns associated with the first level and decreasing after that. Okay, uh, let's conclude this. <laughs> Our general analysis points to a potential naturalization of malicious interfaces, mostly due to its omnipresence. This is troublesome, mainly because it makes visible how large and dominant cap platform capitalism has become. Going back to my initial remarks, we are facing the opposite of privacy by design. Data capitalism has grown so powerful that designers and developers understanding, understand their data, data collection practices as good interaction design. Instead of engineering, and I have empirical ethnographic data to back this up. Uh, instead of engineering privacy from the bottom up, most developers have no other option than to conform, reproducing governance and power practices carry out, carried out by digital platforms. Is not just important but fundamental for social researchers and scholars in the digital humanities to, criti to critique and inquire this new kind of mediation, the performances of digital platforms. For one, our private borders need to account for user interfaces and the agential cap capabilities of data capitalism as a whole. In order to exercise the right to be let alone, we need, to better, we need better conditions to assess what alone means in the contemporary media landscape. Human privacy should be regarded as a complex assemblage of human and non-human actors, a more than human privacy when, which, by which power comes to play an important role. Additionally, as any predatory capitalist practice, practice data capitalism helps perpetuate uh, different systems of inequality uh, Differences of inequality and oppression, especially in the global south and other sites of endangered democracies. Even though digital platforms uh, usually frame, the, frame their work as revolutionary, innovative, and empowering for the user, in reality we have mostly the same old drive for capital and power accumulation. It is not a coincidence that platformization coincides with the rise of authoritarian regimes around the globe. Uh, the gig economy is another problem of that. At last but not least, data capitalism is also a severe hazard for the natural environment. The carbon footprint derived from data practices is getting more and more critical every day. Scholars are beginning to address this as the capitalocene, complicating our understanding of the Anthropocene by accounting how media technologies establish a destructive infrastructure around the globe. Uh, the platformization of everyday life then help us weirdly reconnect with the world. The digital infrastructures that remediate our private life, our household and everyday life are also critically reshaping Earth and its territorial politics. 
we may lose not just our intimacy and privacy, but you ultimately our condition of existence in the planet. This is the rise of platform necropolitics. That's it. Thank you. So I'm sure uh, Daniel has a lot of answer questions. Yes. Maybe when we pull this. two papers together is, I guess the question, um, I guess I'll do it this way, uh, for Fatima, whether you feel as if the kind of pedagogical changes that you are interested in uh, helping to perpetuate in schools, whether there are any of the kinds of dangers of platformization and <laughs> data surveillance involved in those that Daniel was talking about. And then conversely, I would just ask Daniel, if you think that um, the kinds of projects that Coffin is interested in doing, in terms of, especially in terms of creating new forms of literacies, could be directed in a way to help uh, users, citizens, students, um, sort of become more alert or be able to protect themselves against these kinds of um, dark patterns or malicious interfaces. Yeah, well, uh, let me just start because uh, the talk, ends, I'm aware that the talk ends in a very dark note. <laughs> and it's a provocation in, in some sense, in some way. But yes, I mean, like, uh, we have different problems here. Like, we have problems that come in, in the way of the law. We have problems that are problems that are economical problems. We have social problems. Uh, but, like, as someone who has, like, a footing in critical theory, I believe that if we have some way of fighting back is from the bottom up. I, mean, I, I don't believe at all that change comes from regulation and legislation in general. I'm very skeptical of that. Like, and I've, in the case of Zuckerberg, for example, his Senate hearings are a very good example of that because the senators Sorry for it's all, uh, your senators, but uh, they have no idea whatsoever what they are talking about when they are talking with Zuckerberg. So uh, I mean, some uh, some representatives know what they are talking about and they can like argue with him. But mostly, I think that if we are have if we have any chance to like fight back and try to get a hold and get a foot of like what's happening, it's by doing the sort of things that. Fatima research is shows like it's from the bottom up. Like we have to be able to uh, empower them ourselves to fight back because otherwise the the discrepancy of power is so uh, is so so huge. So I I, I would see that that way. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's really it's a, uh, we have to to help, to empower the, the children, the adolescents. Uh, we, we don't have to put the technology away. I think it's really a mistake. We have to work with them uh, and, uh, and to, to, to work it in the way that they, they can appropriate the medium, to get in contact with the medium, uh, to get in contact with the other expressions, and to and become criticized 
about this. This is the concept of media literacy. That is to, to teach the, the children to, to know how to use the media, to appropriate the media, but also to have some critique for the contents and other things that the, the, this kind of problems of platformization, of dark, uh, of asymmetries between the user and the platform. And I think there's a way this is bottom up to talk to, to the children to, and, and construct with, the, with them, not just lecturing. It really, they, they don't get more <coughs> contents from, from these printed book based learnings. They need to do, they need to, to do by themselves. They need to, to, to be owners of this, to be in contact with the media, with the products. Mm -hmm. And that's the way. Mm -hmm. Questions? Thank you. Uh, sorry for my English. I'm from Brazil too. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, uh, I think uh, I have many uh, information that we have to my research here. We've told that about the regulation. Yes. I agree with you that uh, empower ourselves is fundamental. But how we are self you know, the, the normal people uh, against the big company like Facebook, Google, and so on, and uh, my question is, the relation about our responsibility to uh, employ ourselves, our children, everybody, and the state and the company about this regulation. Because I think only ourselves, our capacity to fight against the big company is, is very, our power is very different. So how, how are we gonna do this? Like multiple questions or like um, multiple questions? Multiple yeah, multiple questions. questions. Yeah. You want to go down the row? Yeah, yeah. this one the infamous you too. Awesome. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a visiting professor at the University of Delaware and from Bahia, oh, wow. Federal University of Bahia. Oh nice. And so um, I like it very much in the presentation. And I was wonder when you start to talk about uh, new technology to teach students. Uh, the case of Rio, how is possible? How do you think that you are do this tool to teach uh, using technology is gonna help the students when they are in a, like in favelas or some very poor uh, community in Rio in which they need to survive every day in, in a situation of despair because they can get uh, bullets in the moment. How do you uh, manage it? I mean, do you do, uh, can uh, attract them to pay attention and choose that kind of a, develop that kind of a skill when they are face a different uh, experience from one children from the middle class, upper class, uh, part of the city, even though it's a public school. Yeah, it's really a uh, challenge. Uh, but I think it, what I have to do is to, it's to start from their situations, from their content and to work with them with the problems they have. So we construct uh, uh, from this. This is, the, this is the point. And technology is not just an instrument. You have to, 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 to show them how they can be empowered, because there are uh, the favelas uh, in Brazil, the communities. They are not fragi fra fragile people. They are very expert, and they appropriate the technologies in other ways that they are not the, the uh, company ways, you know. So they, they do, um, how, how we say, they, they do some piratery? Piracy. 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 Thank you. Piracy. And, and they, they, they got the, the softwares, the apps, and they do other things that are for their interests. So I think Thank you. My question is, uh, uh, yes. of this question is for Professor Fajma and his two. Uh, although you start to answer part of my question, uh, what I think, when you try to use technology to teach the students, you are create a market too. 
a market uh, of uh, the technology because some companies have to do this work and you you turn the question that Daniels are talking. This is the first question, how to work this? Because you create a, a new market to these companies because they have monopoly. They have monopoly about this. This is the first part of the question. Second, although you talk about pirataria, I don't know how can I say in English? Piracy. Piracy, although you talk about this, uh, most of people, poor people in Brazil, has no money to, to buy this. You understand my question? How can I use this to teach the students if the students have no money to buy this product? The government will pay for this. If the government pay you for this, with this, we maybe you uh, can feed the companies, the big companies like Google and so on. May, yeah. Can I like address, sorry because it relates to the first question. So uh, yes, 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 sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Ivonette. Ivonette. Uh, oh. Thanks for the question. Uh, so uh, I think that the state has an important part here, but I mean I'm I cannot I cannot be pessimist about it because like when you think about, for example, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon. I'm not talking about Amazon. I'm talking about him as an in, as a as an American citizen. He owns like media conglomerates here. I think it's the Washington Post. Yeah. I don't. It's the yeah. Washington Post. Like he owns the Washington Post. It's not Amazon. It's, he owns the Washington Post. Like uh, when Mark Zuckerberg walks through the Senate, like for the hearings, he's he, you can like almost feel an aura of power because they are very powerful people. So uh, in in those companies, like the 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 this kind of power is also like trying is exerting agency over the state as well. We had a great example of that in Brazil with the civil act of the internet, the Marx mm -hmm. Marx Civil Internet, because uh, it was like a civil regulation of the internet, and there was a lot of lobbying from from like digital companies, uh, most of like telecommunication companies uh, because they didn't want to like have to install the servers in Brazil because it would be more expensive so they what, what those companies as they co the, these companies have like an immense they have power most Amazon and Facebook have more power than most states in the world so that's a problem uh, and I totally like I, I'm totally on board with the representatives here that are trying to break them up, it's important. I think it's important. And the, I don't know if it is my place to say, but I, I agree with those senators and representatives here. Okay, so, and also, and this feeds back to the other question, because for example, uh, in Salvador, Bahia, uh, Google tried to implement a school program, not a school program, but tried to implement a Google for Education program in public schools, you know, and the the city hall and the, the mayor and the secretaries, they became so like, it, for them it's a huge like political platform because they can go campaign, oh, now we have Google for education in our schools, look how cool it is, we have a, this colorful room with like beautiful chairs and computers and use, students use Google Drive and Google whatever, you know what I mean? And then it, it becomes like a, it, it feeds itself. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I would say that like the, the ideal way, it's the ideal, it's not going to happen, I believe. I, I, I think we are doomed, so. <laughs> <laughs> but like the ideal way would be uh, with uh, open-ended technologies, like open source mm -hmm. technologies, encryption, this kind of stuff, you know, so that, but the problem is that, like, why would someone use uh, whatever open source word, word processor when they can use Google Drive that has so many, many more <coughs> capabilities and is more powerful? Here in WM, for example, people use the, the Office thing, I, I, it's already, like, designed by in the system of UWM, if I'm not mistaken, you can, like, access Outlook and Word and whatever. So that's the thing, like, why am I going to use this crappy software when I can use, like, the top tier one 
that's been provided for me for free, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's the kind of like discrepancy that we are talking about. And I think that Fatima work is fundamental to change that. Because literacy can make people more aware and more critical about like, what is at stake when I'm choosing to use Google Drive over open office, whatever, you know? Yeah, I think I'm a little optimistic down there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a joke, of course. But I think that's, there are two things, two different things. Uh, one of them is that the, how can I say, it, it, it's, um, it's kind of tricky because uh, the kids are not so poor like we think. All of the kids has, have, have cell phones. And they use this in their, in their ways, not just in the company ways. Uh, of course, there are everything that they have said about malicious platforms, that, that dark information, and so on. Of course, we cannot be naive. But they are not very poor as we think. This is one thing. The other thing is, we, we just don't work with the digital technologies with the most sophisticated gadgets. As you saw when I presented, we, we use what they have. We use hula hoop, is the name of the... <laughs> in Brazil it's bambole. We use hula hoop, we use uh, the exercise maps that they have in schools. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the thing is, it's a kind of pedagogy. The, 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 the main difference, I think, is that you don't have to, to, to do what Paulo Freire said, uh, called the banker pedagogy. That is like a bank because you make deposits in the, inside of the hands of the children. It's not, nothing like this. We have to teach them uh, the, the competence pedagogy in the uh, is learn to learn. They have to learn how to learn. So they can also, uh, they, they are also criticizing things. They are not in the same place. They are not, a, uh, they don't be dumbest person. They don't be, uh, they, they, they will get their way. That's the thing I think. And that's what I'm going to do. But it's, uh, I think it's a, a common sense to think that they are, that they are so vulnerable, that, that they are so naive. They understand this kind of things. And, uh, well, and I think it's that how we must do it. Mm -hmm. Can you, this is not the question per se, but can you put your QR code back up? Oh, oh, people yes. might be curious about it. Yeah. Yeah. This is my Twitter thing. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is kind of where I'm interested in But uh, in your kind of discussion of the uh, platform organization, you focus mostly on like the uh, big five. Uh, yes. And they're obviously the primary culprits if we really want to get down to it. Um, but I was curious, like we've seen some kind of, in recent, in, like, recent months, we've seen like non big five players like using data in peculiar and maybe unethical ways. Um and can't be another person on of course. But in particular is that like face me app where like it made you look old and then it was like a Russian government like Intel right like collecting data to use. And so when we were thinking of platformization and we go beyond the big five, like how does their use of data and these kind of um, dark patterns, how does that uh, how, you, how does that factor into like what your, your conceptualization of this? Also, thanks for the question. It's a great question because like it's so easy for me to like frame Mark Zuckerberg and Zep, Jeff Bezos with this kind of stuff because they're easy targets. Yeah, but like uh, those the, the the thing is like when we're talking about a, a, a platform as Amazon or Facebook, 
we are talking about like something that is very sophisticated in a way that like you can go when Mike Zuckerberg is talking about like the future being private, he's talking about like, oh, you can go in your Facebook account and be aware of everything. You have we have a privacy policy. You can cu customize your privacy settings in, in the app, you know what I mean? Uh, there are other this kind of thing like FaceApp, for example, they are much less sophisticated. So they are they they are seen like in like in the field they are seen most like scams in a way because like they are purposely built to make that scam and afterwards they disappear like it's it, it's stuff like that. oh I, I made this app so oh let's let's see what how old how I'm look at as an old person then like mm -hmm. it goes viral and like everybody's using it and then like it disappears like out of nowhere you know what I mean like they are so they they are they have like a, a, a they have like a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, like very well defined. They are not built to last. I would say that like they are not. I, I don't consider them platforms per se because they are more like specific products that do specific things. Uh, but like besides FaceApp, we have different other examples. Uh, there was a huge discussion about Buzzfeed, for example, because Buzzfeed usually do this like the squeezes like what backstreet album you are <laughs> backstreet boys album you are you know, like, stuff like that and that goes viral as well and we are like feeding data for someone at some reason so it's there is a, a super interesting book called evil by design and it's like it's a a very instructive book in how to build this kind of uh, <laughs> it's terrible. I mean, it's weird that someone like wrote and published it like this, you know, like someone, yeah. But there is like, there is like a huge market for developers interested in like making those apps just to collect data. I was talking to Richard yesterday. Amazon is running a, a, a sale this week. You can get an Amazon Echo Dot, the smart speaker, the basic one for 99 cents if you subscribe to the Amazon Music Unlimited thing. So you get it for free. Like, what's Amazon stating with this? I'm not interested in selling the, the thing, the hardware. I'm interested in like mining your data. Like, that's the thing. So it's very blunt, it's very explicit. So, yeah, so I, I guess that we can, and I'm thinking about this now, so maybe we can also think about this as a, different kinds of threats as well, different levels of threat. Mm -hmm. Some are more explicit, some are more hidden or like obscured in some way. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I don't know if I answer that. Yeah. Um, thank you, this is really lovely with your questions are interesting and fascinating in, I think, maybe similar ways, different ways as well. <laughs> um, my question is for Daniel. I'm thinking as we're talking in the comments about um, well, I'm first of all haunted by your last slide. Um, and the idea of network politics I'm thinking about now in the context of, um, I mean, your argument is really about the, the unequal valences of power here. Um, but I know we've talked about the book, Platform Capitalism. In that book, he basically makes a very grim assessment of these platform, of platform um, companies. You know, Uber has not found a way to make, a, to mobilize its data, and um, is still receiving infusions of venture capital, even at this stage. And so basically, he, he makes the argument that these um, Silicon Valley startups have required greater and greater infusions of capital to remain in business, basically, longer than, you know, even the, certainly longer than the first dot-com boom. And so now there's a question about, like, this data has become the primary engine of these companies in ways that is even getting away from them. And I think that alongside that problem that they are now, most of them are beginning to encounter, there is um, regulatory pressure and audience user pressure um, about data, even if, um, 
as we say, our lawmakers and many of our many of the users don't really know how the data is used. We just know that it's not something we want. And so I wonder if you foresee any kind of it just seems like a rot from within for many of these companies that don't know, um, like they're voraciously consuming data and, and collecting it, but then in terms of how to monetize it, I mean, Cambridge Analytica, if we believe that scandals have any impact in the future anymore, which I'm not sure that they do, um, that blew up in their face, really. So like, that's one use of data. Um, but I don't know that other uses of data have really been profitable for these companies? I don't know. Yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to ask? Uh, yes, I understand. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think I have an answer for this. Um, thinking about necropolitics, and I think that necropolitics is a super strong idea uh, by Mbembe. I mean, his work is amazing, but like, I, I really like the idea of necropolitics, like, uh, expanding like full calls by the politics to think about like, how, go how Power governs not just the way you live, but also the way you die. Mm -hmm. So this is super interesting because now, in in this is like where power diverts from companies and also leaks into the state as well. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of like journalists and scholars in the multi the diverse fields talking about how algorithms are being constantly used to. Uh, Automatize like welfare, access to access to healthcare, access to to, to like representation as in, in the law. So we are when, when I'm using platform necropolitics as a provocation. I'm thinking about like how we are not just living by the prescription of this platform, but also like there are there are some very critical aspects of our lives, including our death and our access to as a way of a condition of living in the world that are being like because I totally agree with you that there, there is this myth that like oh my god now big data owns everything every decision in the world is made by big data and uh, there was a Twitter thread this week uh, like the guy was saying like 80 something percent of the data is not being used but to anything they're just collecting data mm -hmm. but like even if that data is not being put to use, like the the collection in itself produces a, a, a certain performance of like surveillance and a, a, an enactment of the subject that is also like very powerful because it, it's like it's the, some sort of the panopticon. Like it doesn't matter if there is someone actually collecting the data. What what matters is that you you enact you perform in a state of surveillance and you conform to the decisions that may or may not be informed by data. And that's the problem with algorithms because people regard them as like inaccessible and black boxes and this kind of stuff. So they, these companies, this, this data industry may be rotten from the inside. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't feel comfortable enough to like make a prediction but <laughs> at, at, at the same time I feel comfortable enough to say that capital find its way <laughs> so if uh, we are like talking about platform capitalism today maybe in 50 years we're we'll talking about like I don't know nature capitalism I don't know like some <laughs> form of like in, in some way, capitalism will reinvent its reinvent, and like the book is so good in showing that platform capitalism is not as new because like it has these other problems as well. But I'm super interested in fighting, thinking about how like this idea of necropolitics feeds in this like the superpower of the, these platforms, and that's not that's not something that I've been like that I've truly developed. It's more like a I think that it's a work in progress, so I, I can go that far. Well, why don't we thank the other speakers? <laughs> and uh, please feel free to come to the night floor. We've got some uh, beverages and food laid out for you all there. Thank you very much.